we're back here on Radio Row. Mr. Controversy here with my man D Intellectual. What up, what up, what up? Of course, we have another special guest. This is a 12, playing the league 12 years. Uh, 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 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. Oh, you played 15. 15. Yeah, yeah, don't short me on my years. Don't short me on my years. 15 <laughs> years. I'm miscalculated. 15 years. <laughs> played for, um, I know you played for the Detroit Lions, played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm -hmm. And I'm not missing the team, right? No, that's yeah, it. That's, that's it. it. Right, four, right, right. Four years in Detroit, 11 with the Steelers. That's right. Yep. That's right. Which is your hometown team, right? Yes. Yeah, yep. Yep. Yeah. And um, my man Charlie Patch. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I had to have to laugh. Well, not laugh with you, but you know when you earn those years in the oh, league, yeah. you just like all man, of them. yeah, you need all, all of that, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I appreciate that. But it's an honest mistake that people make, though. It's good. Can you talk about why you're here and what you're representing? Uh, well, no, a couple different platforms. Uh, talking about my foundation, which is the Best of the Batch Foundation. We actually are, are, are an educational foundation, and we focus on reading computer literacy and our STEAM programs. And we are now celebrating our 20th year mm -hmm. with our foundation. We service over 3,800 kids annually. We have 13 different programs that we run throughout the foundation. So it's, it's exciting to be able to talk about that, and we're getting ready to expand. We're adding on 26,000 square feet to our existing building, so that will take our numbers over 4,000 kids annually. So it's just exciting to be able to do that back in my hometown. And then the other platform is the Trust, which is powered by the NFLPA. And we actually help players, NFL, form, uh, help NFL players, transition away from the game. Mm. And a lot of people forget that. And you're like, okay, you know, what? but when you only have trained to be a football player for so long and you live that out, and for me, my example, 31 years I played football. And when I was taken away from you, like, what am I going to do this August? I'm supposed to be in training camp. Like, what the heck is going on? And you kind of, you know, everybody kind of slips into that depression. You know, use that separation anxiety, figuring out what's next. And then hopefully you have that plan. And it doesn't matter how long you played. I played 15. I still slept, uh, slipped into that depression stage. But come out of it. What, what are you doing? What are you looking to do? We're helping to try to expedite that learning curve for a lot of people as they transition away from it. It's an earned benefit that players have created. And at this point, we just need them to activate their benefits. Go to playerstrust.com. Activate your benefits. See what's, see what's out there for you. Because when you kind of remove, remove the way that NFL players are removed from the game, you don't get that when you're in college five years to play four, you know when your expiration date is graduation. Mm -hmm. This is day-to-day, -day, year to year. And at some point, you may not get to the opportunity, but we want to make sure that we're actually letting people know. And it's just important. So I, I enjoy doing that. I've been doing it now over five years. So it's just exciting to be a part of now you do a lot of work with the urban youth. Why is that special to you and what does it mean to you? Well, I grew up in that environment. So when you look back and when you grow up in it, that's all you know. You think everybody lives that way. But then when you navigate and football has allowed me that opportunity to kind of navigate through different platforms. You're playing high school ball, then all of a sudden you're going to college and you're like, wow, what does this college experience look like for me? I didn't have a chance to bounce that off anybody at home. I was a first generational college student. So as I'm kind of learning and having all those questions, I'm, now I'm like, okay, playing in the NFL, I want to kind of now circle that back and let people know, hey, here are things that I've done, some of the things that I've learned, some of the things that you need to know as you now navigate that. Because even though that was 30 years ago, there are still first generational uh, students that are out there still going through this uh, same thing. So I want to make sure that we continue to share, continue to uh, create those options for these kids. And I understand college isn't for everybody, and that's okay. But whatever that looks like, you better have some type of career path as far as what you're looking to do. Figure out a way to monetize it, whether that's through trade school, learn a craft, go out there and make your money. But at the same time, as you learn it and you start earning it, you better return that back to your community. And that's, I'm a big believer that way. That's why I made sure that even though, yes, I'm playing for Pittsburgh, I wanted to make sure as I transition back into my community that we're able to do this. And this is how we're able to do it from the Best of the Batch Foundation as we are serving it. So it's important to go back when you ask that question because this is how I grew up. I have to ask this question. This is more personal. I remember your first ever start. I remember watching it like it was just it was a Monday night game. And what was that like? You know, when it was your first start on Monday night? For me, I was nervous. I'm <laughs> like... I couldn't get the start on local TV. <laughs> I'm on Monday night. Like, man. And then you start thinking, you know, for me, I was thinking about it. I'm thinking to myself, there's been a lot of players in, at that time that never played on Monday night. And here I'm like, man, here I am playing my first game on Monday night. And it was it was pretty cool. It was a pretty cool moment uh, to go back. And, you know, you're nervous, but you just want to play. And you want to prove to everybody, not even prove to yourself, but everybody else, man, I'm worthy of the draft pick. I know I can go out here and play. You want to prove to people that you can do so. So, as I was learning, I was thrown in the fire. I just did. I was just trying to figure it out as I went along. 
and it's just exciting but it was cool for me to be thrown into the fire because it allowed me at that young age even though I never didn't know what it would look like when I got into that backup role I knew how to prepare knew the game speed and was able to help the young guy out with that confidence of the coaches said that I can go out there and still win games and that allowed me the chance to play 15 years yeah we saw a lot of you too we, we both were Bears fans mm -hmm. so we saw a lot of you <laughs> <laughs> your first but, couple but, of years but my first touchdown pass was against the Bears <laughs> yeah. and I remember and I'm sitting back we were sitting on a two yard line and I'm and it was, man that's crazy we were bringing memories up from like 25 years ago and I remember we're sitting on a two yard line Barry Sanders is behind me and I hear the play call coming in it's like a fake counter and we're going to throw this pass and I'm like wow we're on a two yard line I faked the pass, the bam, faked the handoff to Barry Sanders. He faces as if he's running in the four hole. We threw a post behind him because the safety jumps up. 98 yards touchdown was my first ever touchdown pass in Soldier Field. I'm thinking to myself, man, <laughs> I, I guess this is how it's supposed to be. It's not going to be every day. I, I, I didn't get back to 98 yards. My longest at, at, you know, throughout my career was 87 right. to Heath Miller at the, against the uh, uh, Miami Dolphins in 2006. But I'm thinking to myself, man, I don't know if I can go back one more yard and do a 99-yard <laughs> touchdown. Right. And it's funny, all these years later, and I joke with Ben Roethlisberger, and he says, man, I had a 97-yard touchdown. I'm like, well, you still don't have my record. <laughs> <laughs> all the ones that you have, all the, all the 50,000 yards that you have thrown the football, you don't have a 98-yard touchdown <laughs> pass. And it's just that, that's my at least one mark that I have over Ben over anything else. And then you started a few years with Detroit, and then when you went to Pittsburgh, you was the backup quarterback. But it's like you perfected that backup quarterback. I used to make a joke and say, shoot, it might be better off if the quarterback doesn't get hurt because the bench coming in, they're going to win. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so how did you get in that mindset to know that this is your role, but yet still, this is what I do? And the team felt like they rallied with you because they knew we were going to win. We right. could win. And I think for me, number one is, is knowing your stuff. <laughs> I knew the offense, and I, I prided myself on learning it or knowing it better than Ben in that situation because – I knew I wasn't playing, but he was a young quarterback at the time. So when you're building relationships in the meeting room, you want to make sure, hey, what I'm telling you is not as for the benefit of yourself and the team. I'm not doing anything that's going to hurt you. And once we build that communication aspect, man, we'd be talking throughout. And I wanted to see him flourish throughout his career. Now, the way that he played at that time, man, this guy was no fear. He was running around and he was injured a little bit, you know, right. during that time. That allowed me to go into the game, win the ball game, but to prove to the coaching staff, Charlie could still play. So I needed that at that time. If I was in that situation over the past few years before he was injured this year, he played every snap. When you when you don't play, people forget about you, then they want to go younger and get excited about the next generation. It was just something that really all kind of put was put together. We won, we won Super Bowls, and it provided me the opportunity and that platform that I can go out and play and win. Absolutely. Now you have two rings, so you, you've been in the Super Bowl a lot. What is it like for a player? Like we, we're media fans here, hanging out, doing it. Like what is it for a player, and how do you focus on the big game? Right. And I think well, it, it, it starts after that AFC Championship game, which is crazy because everybody's like, "Oh man, you get excited." You come immediately into that and be a building on Monday. You could be hungover, and that's okay. <laughs> Coach is like, "Yeah, I understand. <laughs> Celebrate. Do your thing." That room probably smells like liquor, and it's okay. <laughs> but. As you sit back, he's like, listen, we got to get all of the informational stuff out the way. I need to know rooms. I need to know Super Bowl tickets. I need you to travel for travel. I need all of that by the time you come back here on Wednesday. So you have 48 hours to figure out all of that. Now you're trying to field those phone calls. Who's going? Who's not? How are you going to tell people no? Because you don't have all the tickets that are available for everybody, right? So you lose some friends. <laughs> and it's not personal, but you just they're just not available for people. So now you have to figure out when they're going to come in. You understand the team travel, which you get in on Sunday. The family typically don't come in until Friday because we still have business to do down here. So you're working in back at home in your home city. You get down here Monday, you still kind of enjoy it because we wanted to make sure that let's not act like we're not at the Super Bowl, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, so Monday, enjoy this. You earned it. Right. Tuesday, recover. Wednesday, as we are today, you're getting ready to go out and handle your business. So these two days will be critical. Friday, your family comes in, you go to dinner on Friday night, and then from there, you're kind of leaving them. You all enjoy the festivities. I have 48 hours to a game. And guess what? If we win, man, I can party the next six months. That, that was the next question. <laughs> no, what happens after that day. win? Man, what happens after that win? win? <laughs> so after you win, you have a big, the team has a big celebration at the hotel, and you party like crazy. Now, all they do is tell you, hey, man, congratulations. The first plane leaves at 10, 11, and 12. You better be on one of them. If you're not on them, you're stuck in that Super Bowl city. <laughs> 
<laughs> so everybody parties all the way through. I didn't sleep. We went straight to the plane. And you're kind of riding home. You know, so everybody is enjoying that moment, man. So it's just something that, man, I, I won't forget it. And, and the one that I do forget is the one we lost. We lost the third Super Bowl, Super Bowl 45. We lost that to the Packers. And, of course, going through that whole celebratory thing, they're setting it up, and all of a sudden we lose the game, and you're just sitting there. It's like, <laughs> man, we're down here at this party, and this boy's lame party over here. It's like, it's, it's like a concession speech, right? You're bowling out of the presidential race, and you're just like, hey, guys, and nobody is back at your party. Ain't nobody back there. So we're like, all this food, you're, they're partying, the music's playing, and then nobody wants to dance. Like You're just like, okay, we're here. We filled our obligation. Our family's here. I just want to go back in my room. Go home. Yeah, I'm ready to go my cubby hole, man. Let me go back up here and grieve. It's different because you, because you know, like when the teams are win, the, the um, reporter, hey, you just won, you did this. When you go to the locker room, loss. <laughs> it's one of, the thing that even though you answer those questions, the thing that ticked me off, right? So when you win and you go twice and you win, you don't know what it's like to lose, right? right? right. So we're walking out of uh, Cowboy Stadium and. We literally are going heading to the locker room, and we're kind of everybody is silent. Nobody coming in there. You're taking your pads off. You're like, okay, all right, we lost this game. And then all of a sudden, you take off your pads. You're like, that daggone confetti fell on my dad, fell on my <laughs> in my jersey, man. You look at this confetti on the daggone locker room floor. You're like, man, now you're re you know you're rethinking those thoughts. Now you're trying to do at that point, man. It just you know, let me get dressed as fast as I can, man, and get up out of here. But you still have to be respectful to the media. They're doing their job. And it's just something you have to celebrate that accomplishment. You were there, but that's not why you were there. You were there to win it. And unfortunately, when you don't, man, you start thinking about some of those players that were there and lost that game for their one and only Super Bowl. For me, I think about like Flozell Adams. This was a guy who was great with the Cowboys. Yeah. Ended up finishing his career with uh, with us in the Steelers. We brought him in in training camp. And you think about that moment, and he's going around thanking everybody. We're all emotional, but we're thinking about those guys. And he's like, thank you, man. I just want an opportunity to compete in the Super Bowl. And it's like, man, you're like, you know, you, we know you wanted to win it, but you start thinking about some of those guys that never played another, another down in this league, and that was their only opportunity to get there, man. It's, it's hard. It's hard. You know, your your heart goes out to those guys because you weren't able to accomplish the goal at hand. Shout out to Flozell too. He's, yeah, from, yeah, he's yeah. From, from my area. Okay, from my yeah, high yeah, yeah. Great um, person too, man. When you look at the when you look at the man, it was funny. He got the Pittsburgh. He, you know, big dude. Nobody knew how to uh, attack or talk to him. I'm just like, man, he's just like me, man. He, <laughs> he might be able to knock me down, but I'm I'm loosening him up a little bit, so I like I'll joke with him. You know, I'm a wrestler. He man, get you a little butter out here. <laughs> and we built a relationship, man. It was cool that big flow, man. He was very well respected in our in our in our locker room and when you accomplish everything that he's accomplished he was a leader in that cowboy locker room but then he was willing to now kind of ease that leadership role and he eventually took that over in that offensive line room man guys respected the heck out of him man he's one great person man and you know if he's listening to this man flash shout out to you big flow definitely now with the uh recent tragedy uh, us losing Kobe Bryant. Do you have any favorite Kobe moments or met him or? And never met him, mm -hmm. you know, and, and just kind of looking at the reaction, a lot of it, you know, my initial reaction, I'm like, I didn't know him, but I, man, I hate to see somebody go out like that. Like, that's not, and, and I don't want to wish death on anybody. And that's kind of how I started kind of feeling it. And then you start seeing all of the, the media things that are coming in, just like, man, this is crazy. But when you're sitting here, you know, 72 hours since this happened and people are still reacting worldwide, around you know the reaction is uh, you know with the reaction coming out of it you just look at it and say man people are remembering and they're respecting what he did and that's how much he meant to people and uh, I've learned I'm learning a lot more about him now because of the stories that are being told and I, my heart goes out to you know his family and all the other families that were a part of that it's just something that man you wish never happened and you, you all just lost a family member of the NFL with Chris Doman I don't know if you met him or I don't. Th did he retire before you? He retired. He retired. I met him kind of in the process, um, you know, throughout uh -huh. throughout the, is the league, Super Bowls, and those type of things. So I, I don't know. I have a personal relationship with him, but I do know. I knew him enough to say hello. Right, right, right. Yeah, that was sad. We heard about that uh, today. We want to give our condolences to his family right. as well. And and I have to ask you. You play. We just call it the Norris Division um, against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, mm -hmm. but then. You went to Pittsburgh and played against those Baltimore Ravens. Can you compare the two and which one that you hated to play against? Oh, man. I mean, that was the tough NFC Central that we played in. A lot of people forget that Tampa Bay was in that Central right. Division. You know, they're down there. Warren Sapp, John Lynch. You know, these guys that are sitting back. You're like, man, this is crazy. These dudes out here killing them. And playing there and then going to Baltimore. So I was very familiar 
with that type of defense. The only difference is where they were, Baltimore's a 3-4 defense at that time versus the 4-3 common uh, Tampa Bay team that you knew that that's what they were going to do. you got to stop it. So when you're comparing those defenses and just the mentality of the Steelers' philosophy, man, both of those teams built uh, it built their rosters off one another, and it was a great rivalry throughout the years. And now as it kind of transitioned and you're seeing new names being a part of this rivalry, man, I just want to see some good football. And that's what those two are playing. Other than Pittsburgh, because that's home, mm-hmm. what's one of your favorite NFL cities and why? For me, it was always Tampa. And the reason being was because I was familiar with them. You're playing down there for the first four years of my career. We played in 2002 on a Monday night down there. But going back, I was familiar with that stadium. I was familiar with that defense. Even though years have changed, the defense was still the same. So you knew what you were getting. And I just felt comfortable. And that took me back to my 2010 season. Whenever Ben was out, I ended up starting that game. We were the third game of the year. And we played. We went down and we won 38-14 to 14 during that game. I threw three touchdown passes. And people were like, man, you felt comfortable. It was 90 degrees. I'm like, I wasn't comfortable. I just I don't know what. That's why I wasn't comfortable. But playing in that, in that football game, we won that game. It was pivotal because that took us off to a 3-0 and start. And it propelled us to that Super Bowl 45 season because without that 3-0 and start, who knows what would have happened. So Ben came back. We ended up uh, you know, going on one heck of a run. And uh, we didn't finish it the way that we had, but it was just one of those things. Doing Tampa Bay, man, I felt comfortable with it. I was glad we played him during that year. Whenever he came in, you just knew. It was just yeah. it, like when some backups come in, right, you like, oh, here, go, here go the game. Mm-hmm. When you came in, it was like, hey, the game in good hands. You know what I mean? <laughs> He's not going to cause us to lose the game. And, you that, know what and I mean? that's the point where I knew my role. Here, if, if I was going in and play at any time, whether I was finished starting or filling in for Ben, Monday's paper was always going to be we won because the defense played well and they run the fo- they ran the football. But if they we lose, Ben's out and Charlie played. <laughs> yep, yep. Man, I, I don't want that on me. Right. No, I'm not going to be that right. weak link that you sit right. back and write the story right. about on Monday. Right. So that's why for me, I felt like I needed to go in yeah. and play well personally because I knew what the yeah. stories were going to be the next day. But I wanted to make sure that I can go out there and prove that I can play bring value to this team and the importance because once you go back in that backup role, everybody looking at you like, you ain't playing, but you making some good money. You're like, it's not even about that, but that's just how people right. look at you that way. And it's funny because I'll hear the comments and they say, man, you need to go in that Charlie Batch role. Yeah. <laughs> you need to go in that Char- man, you don't know how hard this is? Man, it's hard to be the backup. Number one, you don't know when you're playing. You got to go out there and perform, and like I just told you, what those stories were going to be. You got to go out there and perform well, and I was a, I was able to do that where it allowed me the opportunity to play 15 years. But that's not the type of career that you have, especially when you're talking about the dollars that you're talking about today. People don't have that opportunity to sit. If you're better playing and you're making money, you better go out there and play. And I have to ask you this: You play with two Hall of Famers, mm-hmm. legendary running backs, Barry Sanders and Jerome Bettis. What was it like playing? knowing that you had them behind you and that the defense was focused on them. It made your job a whole heck of a lot easier. And both of them were different backs, but they were both respected. When you look back my rookie year in 1998, I had Barry. I'm like, oh, this is going to be great over the next three to five years. I'm going to have my man. And he retired on me. I'm like, this is, oh, man, it left a huge hole in our organization. Then I get to Pittsburgh, and my locker literally were right next to Jerome's. So I'm like in awe because I'm a huge fan, Steeler fan. I'm watching him, but I can't show him that. You know what I mean? Like, man, this is bussy. Hey, man, I'm Charlie too, you know? Right. So I'm trying to play it cool. But then I had my fun fan moment, and I'm like, yeah, bussy, I, can I get you to sign my autograph on my jersey? And he's looking at me like, man, I ain't going nowhere. I said, yeah, the last person told me that. Retired on me, bro. Like, Barry, retired on me, bro. He laughed. He's like, that was a good point. Valid point. Yeah. He signed my jersey, and he would come over to my house all the time. So he's like, he's looking around. You can tell, you can tell we kind of looking. I'm like, bussy. I have your jersey, but because we're still active together, bro, I I'm not putting put you on my wall. <laughs> right, like, you ain't going right, on my wall right now. Right. This is great. When you officially retire, it's good. So in 2006, I put my jersey up, and he saw he came to the house and was like, yeah, yeah. I said, I told you that, man. But, man, they were great, man. And at that time, finishing with the two top six backs in the league at that time, phenomenal, man. They both are great people. But I had the luxury to hand the football off to those two guys, man, and I'm blessed to be able to say so. All right, well, we got to let them go. We can talk for hours. Um, <laughs> Again, the 15 year vet. Let's, let's get a quick prediction. Quick prediction. Yeah, yeah, what you oh, doing? quick. Yeah, uh, for me, man, I'm, I'm, I'm staying AFC loyal. Even though I have Emmanuel Sanders on the 49er side, he was a young pup back in Pittsburgh with me. 
I want. I just want to see Andy Reid, man. I'm a huge fan of Andy Reid, man. I want to see him go out there and get this one. Best of all the talent, all the things that people forget what he accomplished in Philadelphia. How hard it was to go to four straight NFC Championship games, go to a Super Bowl, you lose it. Here's this time, man. I just want to see Andy Reid. And I know he's not playing in this game, but he's coaching. I just want to see him get that ring and that opportunity. Do I have? I, I just want. I, I think it's. I hope it's a high scoring game. I want the Chiefs to win. I don't care if it's 42-48. 40, 48-42, that's where I'm at with it. So I'm looking to see, uh, hopefully, the Chiefs prevail. All right. Once again, the 15-year vet, Detroit Lions, Pittsburgh Steelers, my man Charlie Batch. Make sure to stay tuned to the three-point conversion. We will be back on Radio Road, probably your favorite player. Don't go anywhere.